Coming up on Something is About to Happen. Notice he did not give man dominion over other men. He gave man dominion over the earth. That means go into what is in the earth, including the fish, the cattle, the animated species, and create things out of this. So I, your God, I've created nature. You, my people, my sons, the gods of the earth, the sons of the most high, you take what I have created, that is nature, and you now continue my creativity. What is identity? Your identity is who you are. Your identity is who we are. Our identity as a body, as a people, even as a nation, is who we are. My identity is who I am. And that term I am then becomes very significant because uh, you cannot say much about yourself without including I am as a preface or prefix to the pronouncement about yourself. So if I ask you, who are you? You say, I am Deolu. And by saying I am Deolu, you are saying God's name first. God's name, as disclosed to us, is I am. And that means you cannot be Deolu without I am first being I am in your life. So that whether your name is Atinuke or Folon Shaw or Ntiense, and you say the words I am, Ntiense, God is there in the midst of who you are because you cannot be except he first is. In that by saying that he is the I am, he defines himself as existence. God does not exist because he is existence. Existence exists in him and nothing can exist apart from him or without him. So even if you said, I am sad, the good news is that the I am is with you in your sadness. And sooner or later, he's going to turn that sadness into joy. I hear the prophetic psalm declare that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And so when you say, I am broke, it might be an earthly reality, but if you are a Christian in whom Christ dwells, there's nothing called broke associated with your human spirit born again in, God, in Christ. And that means because the I am is with you. He is in you the hope of glory. You ain't gonna be broke for long. You will always have all sufficiency. For God is able to make all grace abound to you always. That in all things you always have all sufficiency for every good work. Moses asked God after he was accosted by God on the plains of Moriah or the mountain plains or the plateaus of Moriah, um, who will I say to, to the elders of Israel, send me, disclose your identity. And I want you to look with me at Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13. Exodus 3 and verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What is his identity? What is he called? What shall I say unto them? Verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me. This concept of I am is hugely important for you and I to grasp because not only is God able to be anything he needs to be, to be your father, your provider, your helper, your strength, your shield, your buckler, he is also the one who defines by reflective imaging who you are. Because he tells us that he made you in his likeness and in his image. So if you want to know what you look like, don't look anywhere else. Look at him. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that nobody has seen the Father except the Son who has declared him, who has revealed him. And so Jesus is the revelation of the Father. In fact, he also tells us that the whole volume of the book, from the beginning of the old canon all the way to the end of the new canon, that it is all written of him. For a body, he, you, 
O God, have prepared me in which to do thy will. And so, God is in who you are. God is with you in whatever you go through. And you cannot exist without God. And you do not exist without God. Your identity is the sum total of your values. What you value, what's important to you, what you consider truly normal to you. Your identity is your innate and inherent capacity, innate and inherent competence, your innate and inherent potential. And so before God created man, he first defined his purpose for creating man. And that creative purpose for which God created man informs man's identity. So if you want to know the identity of man, you must go back to why God created him and what God put in him for him to fulfill the purpose for which he was created. For this, I draw your attention to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And then we'll look at verse 28. And God said within himself, this is intra-Trinitarian correspondence or communication or counsel. God said, let us make man in our image according or after our likeness. In other words, man is going to be so much like God. And remember that God is invisible. So the invisible uncreated is about to create the visible created image of himself. And he says, let them, because of that likeness and image, let them resulting from that have dominion over everything that is in the earth, the sea and in the air, over the cattle, the fish, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the face of the earth. So what he's saying to man is, I'm making you just like myself because I will not be in charge on the earth. You will be in charge. I will not have dominion on the earth. You will be my proxy regency to exercise dominion and authority on my behalf as the sons of God, the regency in the earth. So don't blame God because God is not in charge here. If we're going to blame anybody, blame mankind. And mankind will often fail in his responsibility to exercise divine dominion in the earth when he's not properly connected to God and not functioning in his true identity as the regency of God. And when he fails at that, it makes God look bad, but it certainly also makes man look bad. And we are of the kind that want to ensure that our God, our creator, doesn't look bad. We want to make his name great in Africa. And we're challenged by the circumstances of our country to make his name very great in Africa and in Nigeria. And that's why we're teaching these, these matters, dealing with the crisis of identity in the church and in the nation. So we look now at verse 28. And here, the Bible says, God bless them. So he's, he's created the computer and now he's going to put in the software because if you don't put the software in, you can't boot the computer. So this is the program. And he blessed them. And God said, be productive. That's what fruitful means. Multiply your productivity. Replenish or fill the earth with your product and subdue it and have, and you will have, I add, you will as a result have dominion. Notice he did not give man dominion over other men. He gave man dominion over the earth. That means go into what is in the earth, including the fish, the cattle, the animated species, and create things out of this. So I, your God, I've created nature. You, my people, my sons, the gods of the earth, the sons of the most high, you take what I have created, that is nature, and you now continue my creativity. Because if I am creator, you are also creator. But you don't create from nothing, I do, God says. You create from something, from raw material. So man didn't have fire, 
Men didn't have chairs and houses and roofs and generators. He didn't have uh, iPhones. He didn't have any of that. Nature was in his primitive state. But because he had the same mind as God, he was able to take flint, rub it together, and produce fire. And today, we have sophisticated fire in your hand. This is electricity. He took wood, crafted it from trees, and from the wood, he created furniture and houses and shelter. He was productive. In fact, leading nations that have dominance beyond other nations are nations whose gross domestic product, gross national product, evidence is that their productivity is superior to others and therefore they lead. But often in the twistedness of the contorted nature of man, we use that leadership as dominion over mankind. Hence, we had things like these huge human tragedies called colonialism and slavery. And so, this is who man is. Everyone has a name. a name above every other. The Experience Lagos Concert 2018. Brace yourself. I want to show you the first identity theft. And you'll find that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1 to 7. So let's read that together. Now the serpent, that's the devil, Diabolos, was more cunning or subtle than any of the animated species, any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, has God said that you should not or shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman rightly said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, referring to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Up to this point, she is partly right. The only place where she was wrong is she endeavored to host the conversation with the snake guy. And the servant said unto the woman, now that he has her in conversation, you shall not surely die. He introduces doubt. He introduces the contrarian to what God has said. And he continues. He says, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened. Something desirable. And you shall be as gods. You will be like God. Knowing good and evil. And when the woman, as a result of the serpent speaking, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, while well, there were many other trees that had fantastic food that wouldn't give you indigestion or misrepresentation or misidentification, she, she, she saw it to be good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, that's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the tree desired to make one wise, the pride of life. As a result, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat also. Oh. What you don't know about yourself can easily be stolen from you if you don't know it and own it. So if you own something very precious and you don't know you own it, they can take it from you without you suffering any sense of loss. Everything Christ is, you are. 
Everything he is, you are. If you don't know all of who he is, what you don't know about who he is is also what you don't know about who you are and can be stolen from you. You have his victory. You own it in everything. But if you don't know that, the enemy through symptoms and things you see through your five senses can rob you of what you do already have. That's the first identity theft that you see in the scriptures. And don't misplace it in your understanding because it ruined all of humanity. It put us in a fallen state. If that hadn't have happened, what would this terrestrial sub be like? Okay. So the second identity theft in the Bible that I want to refer to, the ones I want to refer to, the second one I want to refer to, is the story of our text between Jacob and Esau. You know the narrative. And, and the narrative always puts Jacob in, in bad light. And uh, even though he was cast in bad light, he was still God's choice. Let's look at the story a little more closely. And here's Jacob. He has an older brother, twin to him, who comes out of the womb, either before or after, depending on tradition, uh, and, but however, by culture, the Hebrew culture, is known as the firstborn. And um, people conjecture that he stole the birthright and that he stole the blessing. But I, I choose to differ. I don't believe that he stole the blessing or the birthright. Because in the womb, his mother heard from God that the firstborn will serve his younger brother. And the younger brother is going to be the heir of the father's patriarchy. And that that's why you're going through all this trouble in your uh, carrying of the two children in your womb because of this reality. At a later point in time, Esau is out in the fields hunting and he comes home hungry. And obviously before he left, he ate some red porridge that his brother Jacob had made for him. For as he arrives back at home, he says, give me some of that same red porridge or red stew. He would not have put the term same there if he hadn't eaten it recently. So he wasn't hungry. It takes several days for hunger to set in. He only had significant appetite for the natural. And his brother says, I won't give it to you unless you first give me your birthright. You know what his brother said? This is how much he despised the birthright and its blessing. What does the birthright mean to me when I am about to die from hunger? And he willingly gave up his destiny for a fleeting moment of passion, of passionate pleasure to his taste buds. And that pleasure was significant in the way that Esau lived his life, in the sexual, in the sensual, etc. And so Jacob, his brother, by prophecy and by purchase, had the right to the blessing of his father, which was originally in culture and tradition to go to his brother Esau. So when his father is about to bless his brother, who's then strange because he's gone and married strange women. He sends for the boy and says, make me my savory dish from that venison. I haven't eaten in a long time. I, I want to eat that dish so that my soul in relishing this will now bless you. It's hard to bless somebody you don't like. And the father wanted to rekindle the love for his son. So bring it back to me so I can remember those days. And, and shut out of my mind the period from then to now so that my soul from deep inside me, I can bless you. I can give you what my father gave me, what God used my father to give me so we can continue this succession line. The boy rushes out and unfortunately for him, he's constantly depleting his stock. Grow your goats near your house. Oh, you didn't hear me. Let me try the folks here. Grow your goats, grow your stock and your flock nearby so that it is easily accessible for you to use when occasion warrants. So Esau is out there, but his mother 
mother to the two boys heard what was about to happen and she knew it was a significant moment. And being more spiritual than her husband Isaac, she senses the moment and says, boy, Jacob, get here quickly. Go get the kids. Get me two kids from the fold. You can't really tell the difference between ostrich and chicken. And they fix it up. She makes it, the boy's scared that if dad finds out that I'm misidentifying so that I can steal a birthright, which he already had, by divine pronouncement and by earthly witness through the purchase from his brother. Get it? I'm going somewhere. I want to show you Jesus. Said he'll be angry. He said, don't worry. Take me the skin. And, and she took the fur. Put it here. Put it here. And when it's ready, he takes it into his father. We read the text. Look at this closely. Not the firstborn, but another goes into the father in the name of the firstborn and putting on the identity and the nature of the firstborn and the feel of the firstborn and probably feign the charisma and the voice of the firstborn. But even though he couldn't do it perfectly, God had to allow Isaac to bless Jacob, the lastborn, in the stead of Esau, the firstborn, because these things are written for our learning upon whom the ends of the age have come. For the shadows speak of Christ, who is the substance. Because here, what he's showing us is that we have no right to any of the blessings of the firstborn from the dead. We have no right to any of the blessings uh, that God placed on the firstborn of uh, the first fruits from resurrection. We have no rights to his rights, except we come in his name. It goes deeper. Not only in his name, but in his identity. So we put off the old man according to his former lusts or conversation and like Jacob did, put on the new man, fashioned in the same image of Jesus Christ. So 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, therefore if any man be in Christ, all things have passed away, you ain't Jacob anymore. That's why Jacob's name had to be changed because he is now the typology of Christ, Israel. And having put on Christ, he is no longer identifying as the old man. Having put on Esau, he's no longer identifying as Jacob. And I believe God let it slide. Because that shadow was to speak to us of Christ. How we obtain everything we are to obtain from the Father. Not in your own merits, not in your own performance, not even in your own identity, but in his identity, which is now your new identity. Hallelujah. Let, let's look a little more. I'm getting excited before I want to get excited. Let's look a little more. Those texts you'll find in Genesis 25 verse 3. You don't need to turn there. And Genesis 25 verse 29 to 34. That's the prophetic annunciation that the older will serve the younger in 25, 30, 25 and 3. And then the purchase of the birthright. In Genesis 25, verse 29 and 35. I want you to read this when you get home. But I want to talk to you about a gentleman by the name of Kojo Lewis. Born in 1840 and died in 1935. Here is Kojo Lewis. Was born in Africa in Yoruba land, approximately at 1840. And infortuitously, with another 110 slaves was captured and shipped away as a captive slave, human cargo, uh, illegally on a slave ship called the Clotida. That ship traveled for about 126 days from the Bight of Benin um, and arrived in Mobile Bay, Alabama, Alabama rather, in the fall or the autumn of 1850. And by this time, 
uh, Kojo Lewis is a 21 year old man. Mr. Lewis had lost his identity. And the unfortunate result of this assault of the slave trade on his identity impoverished his ability to perform to the ultimate, to his best potential. Lewis Kojo by surname, or Kojo Lewis by surname, obviously did not perform to his full potential. Why? Because of this assault on his identity. I want to draw your attention to the identity theft called colonialism which perhaps is the greatest human tragedy and assault on African civilization. Imperial colonialism seeks to distort your identity, seeks to distort who you are, seeks to rob you of your identity and consequently it, it robs you of your ability to perform. The African problem is a corporate identity issue. It's a national identity crisis. Africa has a huge identity problem. And you'll understand in a moment why I say so. Our continued corporate or continental underdevelopment is the result of these human tragedies called slavery and colonialism. Two dehumanizing things that rob the African of the knowledge of his history and the knowledge of his identity. How we're behaving today is not who we really are. How Africa is underdeveloped and often retrogressing in, in, on top of her underdevelopment, it's not who we truly are. We built the pyramids. We built the ziggurats of Babylon. And these historical facts about our significant development going back hundreds of years was deliberately forgotten, deliberately forsaken, deliberately forbidden, deliberately denied, and we were excluded from the knowledge of our own history. If you don't know your own history, they will sell you a lie about who you are. This is exactly what Satan did to Eve. Her history was the creator. God was the history of Adam and Eve. And he goes into the woman and suggests to her that you don't have that history. You are not like your creator. You are, you are not like the God who made you. And that was his subtle suggestion to her. And as a result, she lost her identity. Africans, you ought to be proud of your ancestry. We are a serious people. Let me give you some facts for this. The ravaging, or rather, unfortunately, the ravaging of who we are historically has affected our performance as a human species. We truly were a very sophisticated civilization that had its most important assets stolen from her. And the contemporary identity thief steals your date of birth, steals your passport, steals your personal identification number, your PIN or your password, he steals your credit cards and he steals your signature. And suddenly your behavior, at least on the records, changes to something that is just not you. And you start showing up in strange places that you haven't been to before. And buying strange things and, and being in strange places that you would never go to because somebody stole your identity. And you're on the record where you are not. The thief, the identity thief, gives you a behavior that's not yours at all. That's what we suffered. That's what we suffered with those two assaults on the African peoples. The assault of slavery and the assault of colonialism. And now we're suffering the assault of neo-colonialism, which is more subtle than the previous two. By the way, I'm not making excuses for our underdevelopment. I'm simply giving you context for where I'm trying to go. The Dutch explorer from the Netherlands, by name Olfert Dapper, O-L-F-E-R-T Dapper, D-A-P-P-E-R. And in his diaries, he writes 
in his amazement and awe at uh, our sophistication and the sophisticated dimensions of our civilization nearly 400 years ago that the roads in the Bini kingdom were eight times wider than the roads in Amsterdam. Hear me. Several expeditions of the Europeans and the English attested to the things that he said. How many Edo folk do we have here? You ought to be very proud of yourselves. Another explorer, Graham Connor, from the United Kingdom, he comes here uh, and sees some of the, the artifacts and the relics of the 16th century. And he comes not too far flung from that time. And it would please you to know, if you're from the Bini Kingdom, that the walls of the Bini Kingdom are 13,000 kilometers long, 8,000 miles long. And it would have taken 150 million man hours over a period of at least 100 years to build those walls. So we didn't only have infrastructural capacity to build infrastructure, we had succession planning in government to sustain infrastructural development. Not like one governor comes, builds, and another governor comes to tear down what he built. You couldn't inherit his assignment or his job as a successor unless you had the competence and the capacity to flow in his vein, to continue what one generation at best can start, but will take other generations to capitalize upon and build so that future generations can reap the harvest of generations that ran before them. Every relay runner knows that his expertise at his, at his sport or his athletic ability to run at high speeds doesn't win the trophy. It takes more than that. It takes ensuring that every other relay runner in his team is as skillful as he is, especially the youngest of the runners, the last of the runners. Because if Moses runs well, but Joshua doesn't run well at all, all of Moses' efforts are depleted by failed succession planning and failed succession preparation. That's why here at this house, most things here are four deep. Four deep. Sila. Graham Connor writes, I was going to cite for you from his diaries and his literature, that when he approached the court of Oba Iwari the Great, this was an African, a Nigerian, an Edo man, probably from Ora. From, from Edo itself, okay, sorry. The great Oba Eware, the great of Bini Kingdom, the greatest monarch of the entire kingdom. This is what Graham Connor said about his court. His court was 10 miles square. I have not seen a European court that size, nor have I read of any that size in history. I want to read, read for you, because I want you to hear this yourself. The king's palace or court is a square and is as large as the town of Harlem in Amsterdam and entirely surrounded by a special wall like that which encircles the town. It is divided into many magnificent palaces, houses, and apartments of the courtiers and comprises beautiful and long square galleries about as large, about as large as the exchange at Amsterdam, but one larger than another, resting on wooden pillars from top to bottom covered with cast copper on which are engraved the pictures of their many exploits. This is 400 years ago in Nigeria. Roads eight times wider than the roads in Amsterdam. That he remarked and said that these people are more sophisticated than we are. They have a civilization that's more sophisticated than ours. He further writes that the walls of the city were 13 kilometers long, eight miles. An earthen rampart girded by a moat six meters or 20 feet deep. This was excavated in the early 1960s by Graham Kona, 
Kona estimated that its construction, if spread out over the five dry seasons, would have required a workforce of 1,000 laborers working 10 hours a day, seven days a week. A ware of 1440 to 1473 when he reigned also added great thoroughness, or sorry, thoroughfares, and erected nine fortified gateways. Excavations also uncovered a rural network of earthen walls 6,000 to 13,000 kilometers long, 8,000 miles long, that would have taken estimated 150 million man hours to build over a period of 100 years. Your people. Can I go a little further? Anta Diop. He writes, and I quote, the false attribution of the values of an Egypt conveniently labeled white to a Greece equally white reveals a profound contradiction which is not negligible as a proof of the Negro origin of Egyptian civilization. As can be seen, the black man far from being incapable of developing a technical civilization, is in fact the one who developed it first. In the person of the Negro at a time when all the white races wallowing in barbarism were only just fit for civilization. In saying that it was the ancestors of Negroes who today inhabit principally black Africa, who invented mathematics, astronomy, the calendar, science in general, the arts, religion, social organization, medicine, writing, engineering, architecture, and much more. In saying all this, one is simply stating the modest and strict truth which nobody at the present moment can refute with arguments worthy of the same. What is he saying? He's saying that it was black Africans who invented mathematics, astronomy, the calendar, science, arts, religion, social organization, medicine, writing, engineering, and architecture. Everyone has a name. But one man has a name above every other. Experience Legas Concert 2018. Brace yourself. The imperialists decimated much of the record of our history. They raped Africa and our artifacts that are signatures to our cultural development, our technological development, our infrastructure development are sitting in their museums. And we don't have museums here. And those artifacts are worth billions and billions, if not trillions of dollars. Today in contemporary Africa, we have another identity thief. This is not the colonialist. This is not the slave trader. This is the African politician <laughs> and public servant who are mostly self-serving, with some exceptions, mostly unpatriotic, very greedy, nepotistic, totalitarian, fascistic, and often despotic. And they are not the only guilty ones. We also suffer from an, an apathetic, unenthused citizenry who choose to do nothing about it. Why is this third great tragedy such an assault on the corporate contemporary identity of the Nigerian, of the African? Because right now, we are losing our national contemporary identity to these new identity thieves. 
monetarily. Identity is the most important asset in the world. It is now known that all the natural resources in the world only account for 5% of the world's capital, the world's wealth, and that amounts to $44 trillion. 5% natural resources. Oil, gas, hydrocarbon, platinum, uh, bdellium, onyx, only accounts for $44 trillion. 5% of global capital. The next in line would be all produced assets. That's things we produce, roads, bridges, infrastructural development, power stations, power generating stations, uh, lampposts, uh, uh, lights on the roads. That accounts for 18% of global wealth. And 18% of global wealth, global capital, is $158 trillion. It would interest you to know that 77% 70 of all global capital is intangible. In other words, 77% of global capital is intellectual. It is in the minds of the people who we are. In other words, 77% of global capital is in identity. Who we are as a people. Real wealth is not in the soil. It's not just in our products. It's in what produced the products. It's in our persons, who we are, who I am, who you are. It's intellectual property. And that accounts for 748 trillion US dollars. And we are the poorest in the world. Do you not know that in 20 years, 40% of the world's poor will be between Nigeria and Democratic Republic of Congo, 40%. I was watching a video of what they call the golden years of Nigeria, and this was in the 60s. Um, and I sent it around to a few friends. Yet when I read the history books about who we were, the Oyo Empire, the Bini Kingdom, the El Kanimi Kingdom, the Mali Empire, what, what's that? The Kanembori Empire, the El Kanimi Empire, or, or that the wealthiest man ever to walk the face of the earth was a fellow, my color of skin, Mansa Musa. Lest they tell us that we're idiots and we're fools and we buy their story. They sell us our own furniture at premium price. Let me tell you, you are at least equal to every other type of human species on the face of the earth. Not only does Christ in you reflect that, but your history also reflects that. That's why we must understand who we are. You must understand who you are. I must understand who I am. We must understand what our identity is. You must understand what your identity is. Uh, we must together understand what our corporate, national, and African identity is. Who we are is our identity. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is his identity, so is he. How and what we know and think of ourselves is, is, is our identity. Our identity informs our values, our culture, our behavior, and our civilization. Our identity is visible in our history. The virtues that make nations great, that makes them perform excellently, are intrinsic to who the nationals of that nation are, who they are, and how they think of themselves. My friends, we need to insist that any public officer, public servant, elected officer who will serve us or lead us must tell us what we are, must speak to the issues of identity, must be part of restoring our identity. Rebuild our corporate national infrastructure. Where are the monuments of the greatness of our ancestors and the great things that they did? Revive literature in our schools and the books that our kids read. Go back to education and don't allow either of the two colonial insurgencies to erase the real history of our prior greatness so that when we look at our forebears and what they accomplished, we will not look down on ourselves because my friend, we have good pedigree. When I sit down on that chair, can I tell you who's sitting with me in that chair? My pastor is sitting with me in that chair. My incredible mother who taught me and gave me many of the values I have, she's sitting in that chair. A black man who was 
the first president of black origin of the World Red Cross. He's sitting in that chair with me. The first CJ of Lagos State, the second CJ of the Lagos Colony. He's sitting in that chair with me. His father, his grandfather, who helped to shape our values, is sitting with us. The good in the great ancestors of the African nation. They're sitting with us. Don't let them tell you that you're a dog or you're a piece of cargo. You are the brightest and the most brilliant. That's in the natural. That's in the natural. How much more in the spiritual? Do you not know that history, if you look at the etymology, it is his story. For this Christ, whose we are and whom we serve, my friends, you must appreciate something very profound, that he is your history. He is also your destiny, but he is also your now. He can change your past completely. You remember the very first event he went to was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And he walks in there and his mother says, they've run out of wine. She said, my son will fix it. Obviously, she knew. He could change the past of many things. He said, he'll fix it. He said, woman, don't bring me out before my time. But he obliges her, lest he leaves her embarrassed. Because all the time she was his mother, he was her father. All the time she saw him as her future, he was her history. And he said, fill the water pots. They're 30 gallons each, this high. 30 gallons each, times six, 180 gallons of water. They filled them up. He said, go and pour them into pitchers in front of the chairman of the feast. And as they took it and poured it into pitchers, the water manifested as wine. Now, wine has a past for it to be wine. For wine to be wine, it must be cultivated grapes that have been harvested, pressed or threshed in a press to extract the juice. The juice is then poured into vats and through a distillative process, it is fermented there for about two years. Two years later, uh, in its process, it's bottled. And the year it's bottled, they give it the date of the year. So if it was a 2018 uh, uh, wine, um, it has a history of at least two, three years. This wine had no past. There's a future that God can create in your life that requires no other past but Christ. And whether you, you, you realize it or not, you have always been the beneficiary of him being your past. But you haven't cast in on it. Here. Yeah. So he gave the water a new future, and he gave the wine a new past. Because he is history. He is the one whom the whole story is about. He is the creator. He is the author, but he's also the finisher. Ephesians 4 verse 19. Ephesians 4 verse 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, verse 21, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. So put off the old man, that's Jacob and Esau and Isaac, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's how you put on the new man. And that you thus put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Having to end. My friends, this is Kojo Lewis. His real identity is not Lewis. His real identity as an African-born Yoruba is Oluwale Koshola. It's too late for him. His identity was stolen. It's too late to restore his identity to him. His identity was stolen. He has no real reference for who he was. When he was captured as cargo, 
treated like an animal amongst many of us. It reinforced in him the loss of his true identity as a free-born African. And then carted together as cargo, piled on top of each other for a 126-day journey. He lost a lot in the process and arrived there to be bought by another for a price. He didn't perform to his potential. It's too late for Oluwale, Koshala. But it's not too late for your children. It's not too late for our grandchildren. It's not too late for our great-grandchildren. Let's help them to learn who they are. Let's revive history. Let's revive his story. Let's revive the story of Jesus Christ. Let's revive redemption's story. <laughs>